Section 9 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 28. Francis I and Charles V. Part 9. In the course of this year, 1524, whilst Bourbon was wandering as a fugitive, trying to escape from his country, then returning to it after a few months as a conqueror, and then leaving it again at the end of a few weeks of prospective triumph, pursued by the king he had betrayed, his case and that of his accomplices had been inquired into and disposed of by the Parliament of Paris, dispassionately and almost coldly, probably because of the small esteem in which the magistrates held the court of Francis I, and of the wrong which they found had been done to the constable. The Parliament was not excited by a feeling of any great danger to the king and the country. It was clear that at the core the conspiracy and rebellion were very circumscribed and impotent, and the accusations brought by the court party or their servants against the conspirators were laughable from their very outrageousness and unlikelihood. According to them, the accomplices of the constable meant not only to dethrone, and if need were, kill the king, but, quote, to make pies of the children of France, end quote. Parliament saw no occasion to proceed against more than half a score of persons in confinement, and except nineteen defaulters who were condemned to death together with confiscation of their property, only one capital sentence was pronounced, against John of Poitiers, Lord of saint Valier, the same who had exerted himself to divert the constable from his plot, but who had nevertheless not refrained from joining it, and was the most guilty of all the accomplices, in consequence of the confidential post he occupied near the king's person. The decree was not executed, however. saint Valier received his reprieve on the scaffold itself. Francis I was neither rancorous nor cruel, and the entreaties, or, according to some evil speakers of the day, the kind favours of the Lady de Breu, saint Valier's daughter and subsequently the celebrated Diana of Poitiers, obtained from the king her father's life. Francis I, greatly vexed, it is said, at the levity of the Parliament of Paris, summoned commissions chosen amongst the parliaments of Rouen, Dijon, Toulouse, and Bordeaux, and made them reconsider the case the provincial parliaments decided as that of paris had the procedure against the principal culprit was several times suspended and resumed according to the course of events and the decree was not pronounced so long as the duke of bourbon lived it was abroad and in his alliance with foreign sovereigns that all his importance lay after bourbon's precipitate retreat the position of francis i was a good one he had triumphed over conspiracy and invasion the conspiracy had not been catching and the invasion had failed on all the frontiers if the king in security within his kingdom had confined himself to it whilst applying himself to the task of governing it well he would have obtained all the strength he required to make himself feared and deferred to abroad for a while he seemed to have entertained this design on the twenty fifth of september fifteen twenty three he published an important ordinance for the repression of disorderliness and outrages on the part of the soldiery in france itself and on the twenty eighth of december following a regulation as to the administration of finances established a control over the various exchequer officers and announced the king's intention of putting some limits to his personal expenses quote, not including however said he the ordinary run of our little necessities and pleasures end quote. this singular reservation was the faithful exponent of his character he was licentious at home and adventurous abroad, being swayed by his coarse passions and his warlike fancies. Even far away from Paris, in the heart of the provinces, the king's irregularities were known and dreaded. In 1524, some few weeks after the death, at Blois, July 20, 1524, of his wife, Queen Claude, daughter of Louis the Twelfth, a virtuous and modest princess more regretted by the people than by her husband, Francis made his entry into Manosque in Provence the burgesses had the keys of their town presented to him by the most beautiful creature they could find within their walls it was the daughter of antony volant one of themselves the virtuous young girl was so frightened at the king's glances and the signs he made to his gentry evidently alluding to her that on returning home she got some burning sulphur and placed herself for a long while under the influence of its vapour in order to destroy the beauty which made her run the risk of being only too pleasing to the king francis who was no great or able captain could not resist the temptations of war any more than those of the flesh 
when bourbon and the imperial army had evacuated provence the king loudly proclaimed his purpose of pursuing them into italy and of once more going forth to the conquest of milaness and perhaps also of the kingdom of naples that incurable craze of french kings in the sixteenth century in vain did his most experienced warriors la tremoille and chaban exert themselves to divert him from such a campaign for which he was not prepared in vain did his mother herself write to him begging him to wait and see her for that she had important matters to impart to him he answered by sending her the ordinance which conferred upon her the regency during his absence and at the end of october fifteen twenty four he had crossed the alps anxious to go and risk in milaness the stake he had just won in provence against charles v arriving speedily in front of milan he there found the imperial army which had retired before him there was a fight in one of the outskirts but bourbon recognized the impossibility of maintaining a siege in a town of which the fortifications were in ruins and with disheartened troops on the line of march which they had pursued from lodi to milan there was nothing to be seen but cuirasses arquebuses tossed hither and thither dead horses and men dying of fatigue and scarcely able to drag themselves along bourbon evacuated milan and taking a resolution as bold as it was singular abruptly abandoned so far as he was personally concerned that defeated and disorganized army to go and seek for and reorganize another at a distance being informed that charles the third duke of savoy hitherto favorable to france was secretly inclining towards the emperor he went to turin made a great impression by his confidence and his grand spirit in the midst of misfortune upon both the duke and his wife beatrix of portugal and obtained from them not only a flattering reception but a secret gift of their money and their jewellery and equipped with these resources he passed into germany to recruit soldiers there the lanxnecks who had formerly served under him in france rushed to him in shoals he had received from nature the gifts most calculated to gain the hearts of campaigners kind accessible affable and even familiar with the common soldier he entered into the details of his wants and alleviated them his famous bravery his frankness and his generosity gained over those adventurers who were weary of remaining idle their affection consoled bourbon and stood him instead of all his army became his family, and his camp his country. Proscribed and condemned in France, without any position secured to him in the dominions of Charles V, envied and crossed by that prince's generals, he had found full need of all the strong tempering of his character and of his warlike genius to keep him from giving way under so many trials. He was beginning to feel himself near recovery. He had an army, an army of his own. He had chosen for it men inured to labor and fatigue accustomed to strict discipline, and thereto he added five hundred horsemen from Franche-Comté, for whose devotion and courage he could answer, and he gave the second command in this army to Jarge of Freundsberg, an old captain of Lanxnecks and commandant of the Emperor's Guard, the same who three years before, on seeing Luther boldly enter Worms, said to him with a slap on the shoulder, quote, little monk this is a daring step thou art going to take nor i nor any captain of us ever did the like if thy cause is good and if thou have faith in thy cause forward little monk in god's name forward with such comrades about him bourbon re-entered milaness at the head of twelve or thirteen thousand fighting men three months after having left it alone and moneyless his rivals about the person of charles v Lanoy, viceroy of Naples, and the Marquis of Pescara could not help admiring him, and he regained in the imperial camp an ascendancy which had but lately been very much shaken. He found the fresh campaign begun in earnest. Francis I's veteran generals, Marshals La Tremoille and Chaban, had advised him to pursue without pause the beaten and disorganized imperial army, which was in such plight that there was placarded on the statue of Pasquin at Rome, quote, lost, an army, in the mountains of Genoa. If anybody knows what has become of it, let him come forward and say, he shall be well rewarded, end quote if the king of france it was said drove back northward and forced into the venetian dominions the remnants of this army the spaniards would not be able to hold their own in milaness and would have to retire within the kingdom of naples but admiral bonivet quote, whose counsel the king made use of more than of any other says du Bellay, pressed francis i to make himself master before anything of the principal strong places in lombardy especially of pavia the second city in the duchy of milan 
Francis followed this counsel, and on the 26th of August, 1524, twenty days after setting out from Esch in Provence, he appeared with his army in front of Pavia. On learning this resolution, Pescara joyously exclaimed, quote, We were vanquished, a little while and we shall be vanquishers, end quote. Pavia had for governor a Spanish veteran, Antony de Leyva, who had distinguished himself at the Battle of Ravenna in 1512, by his vigilance and indomitable tenacity, and he held out for nearly four months, first against assaults, and then against investment by the French army. Francis I and his generals occasionally proceeded during this siege to severities condemned by the laws and usages of war a small spanish garrison had obstinately defended a tower situated at the entrance of a stone bridge which led from an island on the ticino into pavia marshal de montmorency at last carried the tower and had all the defenders hanged quote, for having dared he said to offer resistance to an army of the kings in such a pigeonhole antony de leyva had the bridge forthwith broken down and de montmorency was stopped on the borders of the ticino in spite of the losses of its garrison in assaults and sorties, and in spite of the sufferings of the inhabitants from famine and from lack of resources of all sorts, Pavia continued to hold out. There was a want of wood as well as of bread, and they knocked the houses to pieces for fuel. Antony de Leyva caused to be melted down the vessels of the churches and the silvern chandeliers of the university, and even a magnificent chain of gold which he habitually wore round his neck. He feared he would have to give in at last, for want of victuals and ammunition, when towards the end of January, 1525, he saw appearing on the northern side the flags of the imperial army. It was Bourbon, Lanoy, and Pescara, who were coming up with twenty thousand foot, seven hundred men-at-arms, a troop of Spanish arquebusiers, and several pieces of cannon bourbon whilst on the march had written on the fifth of january to henry the eighth and after telling him what he meant to do had added quote, i know through one of my servants that the french have said that i retired from provence shamefully i remained there a space of three months and eight days waiting for battle i hope to give the world to know that i have no fear of king francis for please god we shall place ourselves so close together that we shall have great trouble to get disentangled without battle and i shall so do that neither he nor they who have held such talk about me shall say that i was afraid of being there End quote. the situation was from that moment changed the french army found themselves squeezed between the fortress which would not surrender and the imperial army which was coming to relieve it things however remained stationary for three weeks francis i entrenched himself strongly in his camp which the imperialists could not attack without great risk of unsuccess Quote, pavia is doomed to fall wrote francis to his mother the regent on the third of february if they do not reinforce it somehow and they are beating about to make it hold on to the last gasp which i think will not be long now for it is more than a month since those inside have had no wine to drink and neither meat nor cheese to eat they are short of powder even antony de leyva gave notice to the imperialists that the town was not in a condition for further resistance on the other hand if the imperial army put off fighting they could not help breaking up they had exhausted their victuals and the leaders their money they were keeping the field without receiving pay and were subsisting so to speak without resources the prudent marquis of pescara himself was for bringing on a battle which was indispensable Quote, a hundred years in the field said he in the words of an old italian proverb are better than one day of fighting for one may lose in a doubtful melee what one was certain of winning by skilful manoeuvres but when one can no longer keep the field one must risk a battle so as not to give the enemy the victory without a fight the same question was being discussed in the french camp the veteran captains la tremoille and chaban were of opinion that by remaining in the strong position in which they were encamped they would conquer without fighting bonnivet and de montmorency were of the contrary opinion quote, we french said bonnivet have not been wont to make war by means of military artifices but handsomely and openly especially when we have at our head a valiant king who is enough to make the various dastards fight our kings bring victory with them as our little king charles the eighth did at the taro our king louis the twelfth at agnadello and our king who is here present at melegnano francis i was not the man to hold out against such sentiments and such precedents and he decided to accept battle as soon as it should be offered him the imperial leaders at a council held on the twenty third of february determined to offer it next day bourbon vigorously supported the opinion of pescara 
Antony de Leyva was notified the same evening of their decision, and was invited to make, as soon as he heard two cannon shots, a sortie which would place the French army between two fires. Pascara, according to his custom, mustered the Spaniards, and, quote, my lads, said he, fortune has brought you to such extremity that on the soil of Italy you have for your own only that which is under your feet. All the emperor's might could not procure for you to-morrow morning one morsel of bread. We know not where to get it, save in the Frenchman's camp, which is before your eyes. There they have abundance of everything, bread, meat, trout and carp from the lake of Garda. And so, my lads, if you are set upon having anything to eat to-morrow, march we down on the Frenchman's camp. Freundsberg spoke in the same style to the German lunksnecks, and both were responded to with cheers. Eloquence is mighty powerful when it speaks in the name of necessity. End of section nine.